Um, the War Department established the first national cemeteries during and immediately after the Civil War to provide honorable final resting places for soldiers who died in defense of the Union. However, in addition to the Union dead, the Department was also responsible for the burial of Confederate soldiers who d died while being held as prisoners of war. In some cases, cemeteries were created specifically for Confederate dead, while elsewhere, Union soldiers were buried alongside Confederate POWs in prison burial grounds that later became national cemeteries. The burial and memorialization of Confederate dead by the federal government is the subject of this presentation. The National Cemetery Administration, which is one of three agencies that make up the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, oversees Confederate burials in more than three dozen locations. The majority of these burials are related to prisoner of war facilities in northern states. In addition to managing these sites, NCA is also responsible for providing government headstones or markers at the expense of the United States to the unmarked graves of soldiers of the Union and Confederate armies of the Civil War who are buried worldwide. The Confederate legacy can be a contentious subject and renewed interest in memorialization challenges NCA and its limited authority to provide federal burial benefits for those who served in the Confederate forces. To help NCA address this subject, the administration sought a better historical understanding of their largest Confederate assets. In 2008, NCA hired a team led by cultural resource analysts to document 18 NCA cemeteries, which included nine Confederate cemeteries and monument sites and nine national cemeteries that contained the largest numbers of Confederate interments and notable monuments. Our presentation is based on this study and reflects the contributions of several team members, most notably Joseph and Maria Sprint of the public history firm Mud Puppy and Water Dog, who are the project lead historians. The 18 cemeteries included in our study vary widely in their physical form and historical development. The majority are located in states that did not secede from the Union. All sites in the North contain the burials of Confederate prisoners of war. Some are identified with specific POW camps, such as those on Johnson's Island in Ohio and Elmira, New York, while others contain the remains of soldiers who died at multiple prisons or hospitals. The Confederate government owned much of the property on which the cemeteries were established by war's end, while other cemeteries were not acquired until the early 20th century. Three sites are not associated with POW camps. The Confederate sections of Springfield National Cemetery, Missouri, and Little Rock National Cemetery, Arkansas, began as separate cemeteries established by Confederate Memorial Associations, while the Confederate burials at Fort Smith National Cemetery date to the Confederate occupation of this federal installation from 1861 to 1863. The history of these 18 cemeteries during and after the war until the federal government established clear policy about the care of Confederate graves is expressed in their physical forms today. And the following slides will give you just a sense of the variety of how these um, of these sites and how the, the burials are marked. Um, here we have Jackson Barracks National Cemetery in Missouri, which contains the grave sites of uh, over a thousand Confederate prisoners of war, both soldiers and civilians, who are buried in several different sections within the cemetery. Um, all Confederate burials are marked with pointed top white marble headstones and making this one of the largest number of individually marked Confederate grave sites in the NCA system. And uh, here, in the foreground, you can see the pointed top headstones that distinguish them from the uh, typical Union headstones. Um, this is Finns Point National Cemetery, which uh, includes many features typically associated with the Civil War era national cemeteries, including the Victorian Lodge and a stone, stone perimeter wall. Um, the, the 85 foot tall obelisk that you see there on the left uh, was erected by the Commission for Marking Graves of Confederate Dead in 1910 and marks the burial site of more than 2,500 Confederate prisoners. A single group memorial was built here because inconsistent records and reinterment activity made the individual grave sites could not be identified. <coughs> uh, this is Confederate Stockade Cemetery on Johnson's Island in Lake Erie, which contains the burials of uh, 206 uh, Confederates, many of whom were officers. This was the first POW camp established by the Union, and 12,000 prisoners were held here throughout the war. The graves were marked in 1890 with white marble headstones, which were purchased um, from funds listed throughout the southern states by a group of Georgia journalists who had visited this site 
and the report in local papers about the lack of permanent markers. The lookout statue you see there on the right was erected by the uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1910. This is Confederate Mound located in Oakwood Cemetery in Southside Chicago. It contains the remains of prisoners from Camp Douglas who were interred in various city cemeteries at the time of their death and reinterred here after the war. The War Department permitted the United Confederate Veterans Organization to place this large monument here in 1895 to mark the grave. In 1911, the federal government uh, raised the monument on this base and installed the plaques that uh, listed the name of over 4,000 prisoners buried below. And then finally, this is an example of a more modest monument. This is Union Confederate Monument in Kansas City, which memorializes 15 Confederate prisoners from the Battle of Westport who died in the city's hospitals. Um, these are individuals who were originally buried in Kansas City Cemetery, which was closed in the 1870s. Uh, they were reinterred in city-owned Union Cemetery, and when the condition for Russian graves of Confederate dead came here in 1911, uh, the original the location of the graves could not be identified, but they erected this monument to honor those soldiers. So in light of all of these differences, uh, the CRA team worked with MCA to develop these questions that would guide our research and illuminate the nature and history of these cemeteries in relation to the current needs of management. Uh, we sought answers that were applicable to these sites broadly as well as specific for each of those sites in, included in the study. While we quickly learned that there were no single or straightforward answers, we focused on those key national events that shaped these sites. Several cemeteries began as components of prisoner war camps established in the north. The first POW camp was established in November 1861 on Johnson's Island. At the time, Union leaders believed that this and maybe one or two other sites would be adequate to house Confederate prisoners. Uh, by contrast, by the end of the war, 215,000 Confederate soldiers would be held in Union, Union prison camps. Um, military engagements would sometimes result in the surrender of thousands of men in time, and so the Union scrambled to find a place to house all these prisoners. Um, they were off, often uh, created prison camps at uh, places that had served as Union recruitment centers, such as that in Elmira, New York, that's shown here. Oh. Uh, well, neither the Union nor the Confederacy was adequately prepared to house so many prisoners. It resulted in poor conditions, and in total, uh, 26,000 Confederates died while imprisoned, which is about 12% of all captured. Uh, Union losses were even more devastating with 30,000 troops or 15.5% of all POWs dying in Southern camps. Um, Twelve of the cemeteries included in this study are associated with these prisoner of war camps while well, interments at Philadelphia National Cemetery, Cypress Hills National Cemetery, and Union Cemetery are prisoners who died while being treated in local hospitals. Burial records for prisoners were minimal and burial practices were inconsistent. Uh, most prisoners were buried in trenches, but they were placed in individual coffins. Victims of infectious diseases such as smallpox were often buried in separate cemeteries. Uh, graves were typically marked with simple wooden headboards, as you see here, um, and often labeled just with a number that corresponded to the surgeon's desk record. Um, the grave seen here at Woodlawn National Cemetery had a bit more information, including individual names and other identifying information that was painted onto the board. Uh, after the war, many of these grave sites received little attention, and the paint faded, uh, the boards rotted, and they were often dislodged from their original locations. In addition, many of uh, the Confederate burials were moved following the war uh, either to consolidate scattered burials or to uh, move them to more suitable locations or make way for civic improvements. Um, in these instances, uh, they often found it very difficult to individually mark Confederate grave sites when the efforts to do so began in the early 20th century. Uh, 
meanwhile, while you know, many of these Confederate grave sites in the North were, were largely neglected in the later 19th century, Union remains were being consolidated and consistently marked in the newly established National Cemetery. Um, legislation passed in the 1870s opened eligibility uh, to all U.S. veterans and laid the foundation for the appearance as we know them today. Uh, this is Seven Pines National Cemetery in Virginia, and it just shows you some of the typical characteristics of the National Cemetery, including the substantial lodges, the uh, brick perimeter wall, and the individually marked grave sites. <coughs> Meanwhile, in the South, Ladies Memorial Association and Confederate veterans groups were working earnestly to mark the grave sites of fallen Confederate soldiers. Uh, they were credited with establishing the first Confederate Memorial Day in the 1860s, and these organizations erected monuments both in cemeteries and in public spaces uh, to honor the men who had fought and died for states' rights and Southern honor as they were characterizing the conflict. <coughs> they also established Confederate cemeteries where scattered burials were consolidated and were best seen to die long after the war could be buried. <coughs> this was the case um, at the cemetery in Springfield, Missouri, which would later become a portion of the Springfield National Cemetery in 1911. Um, so by the end of the 19th century, the common experience of the Spanish-American War, which was fought in 1898, was starting to uh, contribute to a spirit of national reconciliation. <coughs> At this time, this issue of the proper uh, marking of Confederate grave sites in the North first really entered into the national conversation. In a speech to the Georgia legislature in uh, December 1898, President McKinley recognized the contribution of Southerners to the recent war effort and called for national unity. He proposed that the Union is once more the common altar of our love and loyalty, our devotion and sacrifice. Every soldier's grave made during our unfortunate Civil War is a tribute to American valor, and in the spirit of fraternity, we should share with you in the care of the graves of the Confederate soldiers. Um, at the same time, individuals in Washington, D.C. were beginning to lobby Congress on the issue. Uh, proponents included the United Confederate Veterans and uh, ex other ex-Confederate soldiers who were now in public service. Uh, their first su success came in 1900 when a law was passed that appropriated funds to create the Confederate section at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, the law mandated the consolidation of Confederate burials uh, that were, had been scattered throughout that cemetery as well as those at the National Soldiers' Home in Washington, D.C., and called for the marking of these graves with proper headstones. Uh, the Arlington headstone is shown here. Uh, it's similar to the Union headstone, except for its pointed top and that it lacks the um, Union shield design. In 1930, the uh, Confederate headstone design was modified to include the Southern Cross of Honor, which was a... Um, award that was conceived of by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1898 to honor Confederate soldiers and their families. So after the establishment of the Confederate section at Arlington, the federal government felt increased pressure to permanently mark all Confederate grave sites. In 1906, Congress passed the Public Act Number 38 which was to provide for the appropriate marking of the graves of the soldiers and sailors of the Confederate Army and Navy who died in northern prisons and were buried near the prisons where they died. Uh, this bill established the Commission for Marking Graves of Confederate Dead. The commission, which operated from 1906 to 1912 and again from 1914 to 1916, was led by a total of four men, all of who were um, ex-Confederate officers. And much of the work of the commission, much of its success can be attributed to the work of L. Frank Nye, who served as clerk to all four commissioners. And he was the one who's really responsible for doing the legwork for tracking down information about the Confederate soldiers at all these sites um, that were uh, under investigation. And 
the original legislation called for the marking of these graves with an individual headstone, but now I've soon discovered that at many of these um, POW camps, that just simply wouldn't be possible. Um, at these locations, inconsistent records and complications resulting from multiple reinterments um, made it impossible to, to go back and, and actually match up the uh, burial records with individual graves. So the commission sought the permission of the War Department to erect a single monument uh, at each of those, these locations, which would include the names of all the soldiers who died at that site. Um, Confederate Mound, which we, we saw earlier, um, already had a, a monument in place, so they agreed that they would raise the monument and place it on its new base, which would uh, include plaques listing each of these names. More modest group monuments were also erected at places like Philadelphia National Cemetery, um, as well as uh, Green Lawn Cemetery in Indianapolis, Woodlawn Cemetery in Terre Haute, and Union Cemetery in Pacifica. Um, and some sites, including uh, Camp Butler, Elmira, Camp Chase, and Rock Island, which is seen here before and after the work of the commission, uh, they were able to reconcile the military records in order to install individual headstones like those that had been employed at Arlington. By the end of 1912, the commission had largely accomplished its original mission. It had marked Confederate graves in 53 cemeteries located in 15 states, including 15 of the 18 cemeteries included in our study. Uh, when the commission was reinstated a few years later, the provisions of the bill were expanded to apply to Confederate grave sites located on federal land throughout the country. Um, however, identifying Confederate burials in the South uh, generally proved to be too great a challenge. And when the commission expired in 1916, it had accomplished little towards this new task. Uh, the commission for marking graves of Confederate dead was not extended, but it had marked more than 25,000 graves and installed individual monuments where graves could not be identified a federal legacy that the NCA is steward of today. <coughs> uh, the 1914 bill that reauthorized the commission included a new task that called for uh, the furnishing of headstones of durable stone or material of, uh, for unmarked graves of Union and Confederate soldiers, sailors, and Marines in national, post, city, town, and village cemeteries, naval cemeteries, and naval yards and spaces of the United States. Uh, in essence, this provision gave the War Department the yeah, authority to mark any Confederate grave anywhere in the United States, um, though no corresponding funds were allocated to that particular task. So uh, Confederate graves at Fort Smith, Little Rock, and Springfield, which I mentioned earlier as not being associated with POW camps, were later marked under that authority. Um, so responsibilities for the 18 sites included in our study um, were transferred from the Army to the NCA in 1973, um, including uh, the authority to furnish government headstones for Civil War burials uh, located worldwide. So I'm not going to turn it over to Sarah, who will kind of let you know what that has means for NCA today. in a different direction. Um, as you've heard uh, a lot about our properties and we're very excited about the information that CRAI and uh, Mud Puppy and Water Dog and, and other, they're all, it's a, it's a large team of people who have been, uh, have been finding great um, primary sources and images that we didn't know existed out there. Um, 
MCA is responsible for maintaining properties containing Confederate graves included in this study, but in all we have thousands of Confederates buried in more than three dozen of our properties. Um, I'd like to say that I could tell you exactly how many and where, but we're not quite that precise at this point. Uh, we will be. And we are equally the steward of all Civil War history resources that we inherited from the Army. In recent years, Confederate issues have gained momentum, uh, perhaps due to the, and I'm quoting, neo-Confederate monument cited by the Atlantic writer Stephen Weiss last year. Um, in keeping with long-standing policy originating at the conclusion of the Civil War and subsequent agencies and departments uh, with jurisdiction for these properties and features, NCA's policy is not to interfere or to further a cultural position. We, pr we pr respond by providing a headstone or marker if it is within our legal authority. And that's a pretty straightforward thing that a lot of people um, who come to us for whatever um, don't really understand that. Uh, our policies and processes associated with pre-World War I products, which is um, an, an internal segregation of our, project, uh, our, our products, but obviously this does include the Civil War, um, it, um, people are often disappointed, uh, applicants who come to us asking for something are often disappointed. Um, primary records might be inadequate. Um, we review all the records that come to the office or the applicant doesn't meet the definition in regulation. And that's very important and um, especially in recent years. As a federal agency, we promote honorable military service and honor veterans and Confederate soldiers as permitted by law. In fiscal 2013, NCA provided more than 350 headstones and markers to Confederate graves in non-federal cemeteries, and that's typical. Just last week, based on rigorous verification of some uh, primary documentation, we installed a new Confederate headstone for Private Haywood Treadwell at Beaufort National Cemetery because although his name and his unit information were documented as far back as 1915, his, head, his grave was incorrectly marked as an unknown. While the Army had broad authority at the time of the war and during rec reconciliation to inter Confederates in its cemeteries, NCA, which was established in 1973, has never had the authority to provide a burial benefit to Confederates in national cemeteries. Confederate remains may be marked if they lie in NCA property or meet the requirements for a government furnished marker in a private cemetery, however. And I'm showing you two examples of um, Confederate headstones uh, over the years. They've evolved um, in, in, even when you see you know, multiple remains under one headstone. Uh, we have quite a, a variety of uh, grave markings throughout this system. It's not quite as straightforward as, as one might think. Meanwhile, consider the Army's creation of a new, larger, and much better headstone for Confederate graves in 1930. Glancing at some prominent private cemeteries, and none of these were included in the study um, that, uh, that you heard a few minutes ago. I'm showing you Hollywood in Richmond, Mount Olivet in Nashville, and Confederate-only sites in Knoxville, Marietta, Georgia, and Charlottesville, Virginia. It appears that keepers of these Confederate dead were disinclined to order this new headstone product. <coughs> These cemeteries historically were recognized uh, with a single monument or multiple markers, but not headstones provided by the U.S. government. And, and this cannot be happen chance. What were independent memorial intentions realized at the turn of the century today by right should remain authentic Confederate landscape based on American historic preservation practices. But in the past quarter century or so, absent a soldier's or a first person advocate for uh, the loyalty toward original intents at these properties, Confederate descendants have more recently sought the provision of a government issued headstone as an entitled benefit that somehow their forebears 
in previous decades uh, missed out on. So the area around the Confederate Monument at Mount Olivet here has been uh, populated by slosh markers from the U.S. government. And uh, I, I think they're ornamental. I don't think they're remains or uh, anything below there. And similarly, in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the Confederate Cemetery, there's a lovely historic monument, late 19th century, and the names of the individuals who are buried in the cemetery are listed on the monument. Um, and there is a letter that shows where individuals are, are, are located. So you could put a headstone on them, but that was not done um, when it was established. These are some of the quandaries we deal with. I did want to point out one thing, this is a tangent, that this is Hollywood Cemetery. And the, the first uh, speaker we heard uh, had a, a very interesting uh, pyramid here that I, I'm, if you want to go back and see if there's a relationship between the Romans and the Confederates, but that's a research topic for years to come. Um, we're at Crown Hill Confederate lot. Modifying historic cemeteries using 21st century forms of memorialization doubles the degradation of the historic landscape. The carefully crafted original vision of the Ladies Memorial Association or the responsible veteran organizations are often completely overlooked or ignored. And the installation of the modern grave markers may intrude on, uh, upon landscapes and transform them into a place more familiar to a 21st century visitor than his or her grand grandparents. At Crown Hill, such an in, a change was introduced in or about 1980. This is the original monument, um, but uh, some enthusiasts in town felt that the names of all the people who were moved here, and I think this is the third time remains, these remains were relocated, had to be uh, literally cast uh, in, in metal. And this is literally a postage stamp size lot. And the, the plaques have completely filled it out and they actually put one on the monument itself. This is the tale of two Oakwood cemeteries in Virginia. And these are the, this is Virginia, bottom and upper left. In Virginia, the Sons of Confederate Veterans has requested of NVA potentially thousands of upright headstones to be placed in the Oakwood Cemetery's Confederate section in Richmond. This is a National Register listed property. Their goal is to properly, in quotes, mark graves currently identified by a small block, and these are numbered, and the numbers correspond with a ledger. And there are up to three individuals remains under each of those blocks. Not literally, but in spirit. Um, if the effort for obtaining headstones, which is a 21st um, goal, uh, a, a 21st century marking goal, the results would look more like uh, this, a cemetery in Raleigh, North Carolina, also Oakwood, where over, uh, this is decades ago, but these are these little blocks, the back of the upright. And this would be uh, turned into this. Uh, legally, we cannot double mark a grave. So uh, what happens to the historic monument, the marker? Um, we are engaged with the State Historic Preservation Office at some level about this, but that's also uh, a complicated uh, situation. Um, you've already heard a little bit about um, yesterday's success, the, the general going back on his pedestal. Um, but we, uh, we know of 33 Confederate cemeteries. I, I'm not trying to fudge the numbers, but sometimes you have a monument that says for all wars or all of this, and it, it's hard to uh, pick and choose if you know the Confederates or the Civil War is involved in that. So it's not, I'm not gonna go through um, 
the, uh, th this monument in particular, but we have more than 1,200 monuments, and 33 is not that many in that uh, context. Um, iconography is the, uh, an issue with us, or I guess with other people. Um, excuse me, I'm getting a wrap-up sign too. The display of, of Confederate flags in memorial programs are limited to NCA cemeteries where Confederates are interred, and, and then on very li limited occasions. At Point Lookout, Maryland, which is here, um, uh, we have a large obelisk, and you're only really seeing the base of it, and a, a Confederate group acquired an adjacent parcel of land in order to uh, erect its monument to the same POW uh, that and so you're looking at this, and this is fairly recently. On a sort of a related uh, issue, um, all of our headstones, except for Confederate headstones, um, have an option for an emblem of belief, as it's called, and it's basically religious um, observations. Years and years ago, uh, someone requested to use the Confederate flag as an emblem of belief, and that was rejected. Um, I want to say that uh, we, we are going to use all the information that our consultants have gathered for us. Uh, and this is uh, really just uh, a, a glimpse of the story of the Confederates and federal properties. Um, the historic information will soon be accessible to the public in two ways. Later this year, NCA will be uh, publishing the study that's uh, the result of this, this work, <coughs> includes the work that the Brents of Mud Puppy and Water Dog worked on, the CRA and the NCA historian. And we all collaborated on this. We're also installing interpretive signs at the 18 study sites. All of this will be complete in fiscal 14 if things go well. Um, the book and the signs will be posted on the inter inter NCA website. The book will also be published in paper. Um, these products and ongoing conservation of historic monuments are tangible illustrations of NCA's stewardship of American landscape and its commitment to preserving and understanding its role in the American history in the pivotal Civil War era. <laughs>